I successfully survived the first 10 seconds of my uh, TEDx talk. I consider this as a um, major achievement. Uh, I'm a psychologist, and this is not a coincidence. I can track back to my early teenage years that I was concerned with the very existential questions of life. I was thinking about who I was, what was my true nature, what was happening in life, what was the life all about, what was the meaning of it. Um, and that was a core thing I was occupying myself back then. And I do know that most people do think about those questions, at least to a certain degree, at least in cer certain periods of lives. Yet the situation with me was that I was rather um, serious, actually that serious about it, and I still am. And because of those questions, I committed a suicide when I was 16. I mean, I did all the necessary actions, and as far as I was concerned, I, was, I, I did it, but this body refused to die. But the, the reason why I decided for that step was that I was so curious what would happen afterwards. What comes after death? I couldn't wait. I was so curious about that. And out of the same curiosity and longing to know, to understand the true nature of life, I was a few years later when I was, actually one year later when I was 17, roaming around Africa, hippie style, on the roofs of the trains and backs of the, the lorries and trucks through jungles, They're trying to squeeze some meaning and some sense out of this, this life. And then, a couple of years later, again roaming around India in search for enlightenment, meditating in ashrams and chasing old gurus all over the place. Uh, with the, it was the same longing, and I had the same longing continued. So I spent years in meditations and, and heavy-duty personal retreats and so forth, some a lost case in a way. Um, however, I did learn one thing, at least one thing that I'm pretty sure, pretty certain of. And this is that in our nature, there is something that I will call life. And it's an uh, amorphous, limitless essence of us that wants to embody fully, that wants to manifest, that wants to explore, wants to create. And that's, I would call, our, our core. And this essence, this life in us, gets manifested through our human, basic human needs that I understand as core longings of our organisms for certain qualities in our existence. That would be longing for love, longing for connection, meaning, closeness, belonging, understanding, respect, support, free choice, autonomy, and so forth. So there is, there is this core learning, core longing in us for these qualities. And actually, in practical terms, it seems that whatever we do, whatever we do, whatever thought we have, whatever emotion we have, it is always our organism stretching for meeting certain needs. It's always an attempt conscious or unconscious, to meet certain needs. I don't know if, if that resonates with you, but it made me think a lot that actually whatever a person does, says, thinks, it's always an attempt, a longing, an attempt to meet a need. Always. So when a small, let's say a little child, says, leave me alone, I don't want to talk to you anymore, it may not seem at the first glance as a longing, but there is maybe a longing for some autonomy or to be seen, expressed in a way that sometimes parents have difficulties to understand. So um, even violence is an expression of an unmet need. Marshall Rosenberg said 
that uh, very often that violence is a tragic expression of an unmet need. Because by being violent, I'm trying to meet some needs of mine. However, I'm doing that in a way that is not going to, in the long term, meet my need, but will create more and more commotion and, and difficulties. So that's why it's tragic. It is an expression, but it's a tragic one. Um, if, and in my work, and I work, I've been working for 24 years in the realms of personal growth and communication and conflict resolution. I work as a trainer, I work as a, a mediator in conflicts or f as a facilitator of large groups. Basically, that's my realm and he's been my realm for more than half of my life. And in my work, I almost on a daily basis, I can see that how uh, violence is nothing but a tragic expression of unmet needs. What at the beginning starts as the very intense conflict when a lot of harsh words and violent words are being said. Then with some support and some help, people that were just, just right now saying those words, they can come in touch with what is beneath, what is underneath. And they see it's pain, it's suffering, it's um, some uh, sadness. And so that they, they realize that this needs, some of their needs were so unmet for such a long time or neglected that it became unbearable. And then they did the best they could and it was a violent behavior. And once they're in touch with these needs, they can start sharing them in a way that makes it possible for other people to hear. So maybe they will say something you see in situations like this, I'm feeling so sad and so frustrated because I so much long for some recognition of my contribution. And I so much long for being seen in, in, in my attentions. And this is something that the other person can hear. And when they can hear it, connection happens. Suddenly they can hear each other at this vulnerable level of, of humanness and connect. And it so often inspires me to see how quickly, after the, the human connection has been established, how quickly um, all problems can be solved, just like that. And it very often disheartens me to see how long it takes, how long it takes for us, or for, for a person, to reach that point. So, in a way, it's, as we heard today, there is optimism, there is pessimism involved. So if we could only communicate our hearts directly, if we could only communicate ourselves directly so that other people can, could hear us. Now, that, that would be great. However, we have some difficulties with communication. And I don't know if you ever thought about that, but we humans, we invented communication because of very practical reasons. Because we wanted to connect to the inner world of other people. We don't have a direct access to, other, to the inner world of other people. What I see is your faces, I can hear your words, but I don't have the direct access to your inner world. And with communication, we try to establish that so that we could first cooperate and make plans how to hunt bears and uh, elephants or anything, and then how to also meet our needs for um, companionship and underst understanding and so forth by sharing more subtle and more complex um, content of our inner worlds. And this was, this, this was going on pretty nicely. And then, some people say about 7,000, 8,000 years ago, maybe more, maybe less, human society started to become pretty complex and the vertical stratification started to happen. And then for the first time in history, this notion came into the, the picture that there are some people who are less worthy and there are some people who are more worthy than others. So suddenly, after a battle, when 3,000 soldiers died, everybody was celebrating the fact that the king was still alive. Because his life mattered much more than the life of 3,000 or 30,000 uh, uh, soldiers. The, the, the value of human life started to, to get a, a new picture. And then a new element in communication was invented. And I will call this element a disconnecting element. So when I was communicating to you, 
I was still trying to connect our inner worlds, that's true, and at the same time, I was trying to plant a virus. And a virus is a thought that you are less than I am, and that I am more than you are. So there is a connection happening and a disconnection. You are down, I'm up. And, of course, this started to happen many years ago, and then it became, this disconnecting language became more and more subtle with every generation. And we, who are here, we drank it with our mother's milk. Through the stories, through the movies, through uh, reading novels, through observing interactions around us. And that's the reason why it's really deeply seeded in us. And why the first moment when a person doesn't do what I want this person to do, or that person behaves in a way that I don't like this person to behave, the disconnecting cognition and disconnecting language will come out of me, like that. And there are a few um, shapes of the disconnecting language. I just want to mention a few um, so that we can recognize them. One is labeling or diagnosing other people. When, pe when other people don't perform in a way I would like them to perform, I diagnose them. He's so stupid. He's primitive. Uh, he's uh, emotionally unstable and spiritually unadvanced and conflictual. It's, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. You know, the other person. And we like to blame people. Blaming is denying responsibility. It's not me, it's you. You started it. Of course you did. Don't stare at me like that. We both know you did it because you said that. And da, 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 da. then we go back into the history of biblical times. Who started it? And then I also think in terms of what you deserve, whether you deserve punishment or reward. Of course, if you did what I asked you to do, then you will get an award. If you did not, then you will be punished, because you deserve punishment, and I'm here to provide it happily. And then I will demand you to behave differently. And if you don't, I will punish you even more. And it's a, it's a story of our communication. That's, that's why we like to go to the coffee with people that, that agree with us. And so we talk about other people who are stupid and wrong <laughs> and, and primitive. <laughs> And it really goes global. In glo global terms, it's all about us and them. Us, who are okay, who have the right language, the right culture, the right religion, and them, who are wrong, who actually deserve bombs, because they are asking for them. So, um, this is a sad story about the communication. And in nonviolent communication, that's the model that I am most passionate about and I use in my work, um, Nonviolent communication is a process or a, a, a view of, of life that was originated by Marshall Rosenberg and it's carried out and, and cared for by Center for Nonviolent Communication. And in this um, nonviolent communication, we are trying to find ways so that we can really communicate, finally, in a connecting way, so that we can fully express ourselves not be just nice and diplomatic, but fully express on ourselves. However, to do it in a way that will make it possible for you to understand it. And we also try to make our ears bigger so that we can hear behind words. Even if you're not perfect in expressing yourself, that we can still hear what you're actually longing for and what you're trying to say. And then this way, perhaps, create a, a connection. And finally, get the communication to work. So that's the, that's the idea. It takes a lot of transformative learning. It takes a lot of personal growth. It takes a lot of skills, as you may imagine, because we were so successfully trained throughout our lives into the disconnecting language. So we need quite a lot to, to, to go through that. So having said all of that, my understanding of global citizenship is that, A, it is, it is um, transforming the disconnecting language into a connecting one. It's transforming, actually, the cognition and going beyond words and beyond accusations and labels and so forth. And it is also in realizing that we are actually not separate, that we actually are a global 
village or a global family, and it's not us and them and you and me, that we are actually a, a, a family. It's really integrated, integrating this reality. And it is also to grow out of the egocentrism, the childish egocentrism, me, 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 and to grow out of the also childish ethnocentrism, us versus them, and step into the new paradigm of universalism, all of us, all of us. There is one story that I really find very inspiring. It goes back to the First World War. It was 1914, 24th of December, someplace in Europe. Um, the First World War was already going on for five, six months. And uh, it was winter. And there, was, there were trenches on the front. Kilometers and kilometers, millions of soldiers were in those trenches. And some places, the trenches were just 50 meters apart from the opponent's side. Trenches were full of mud, blood, dead bodies, rats, excrements. Um, it was really cold. And it was 24th of December. And suddenly, an extraordinary thing happened. German soldiers started to light candles on the little trees that they were sent as a um, comfort um, from their countries. And then they started to sing Christmas carols, Silent Night and others. English soldiers on the other side were shocked. And they, they responded in a natural way by applauding. Then English soldiers started to sing their Christmas carols, only to be greeted by applause on the other side. Then one person, and the next person, and the third person, climbed out of the trenches and walked across the no-man's land to meet other people all over there. Suddenly, they were, they were followed by hundreds. They shook hands with, with the opponent. They exchanged cigarettes. They were showing each other photographs of their families. And in the morning of the 25th of December, Tens of thousands of soldiers were walking around this no man's land, talking quietly to one another, helping each other to bury their um, colleagues and comrades. Even some soccer matches were reported. Humanity was happening, and the insanity dispersed until the generals on both sides heard about that. They took measures, regained order, War continued into 8.5 million military deaths. For what? I do remember when I was a little child, I was hearing these stories, heroic stories, about wars and killings. And I couldn't connect to that. I couldn't connect. I didn't see any heroism there. All I saw was stupidity and insanity. And that's still so alive in me. It's so painful and so alive in me. And at the same time, I know it is not them who will change the world. It is me and you who will change it, nobody else. And to me, that means to wake myself up as many times as I can per day with the question, what kind of life do I want to live? What kind of person do I want to be? How do I want to live my existence? How do I want to make this life in me and around me more beautiful for everybody? So for me, that's the essence of global citizenship, and I think we really need something like that. Thank you.